Good afternoon. Thank you for joining and welcome at today's uh, webinar, focusing on the update on the EU Commission study on new genomic techniques. This webinar was organized together with ENGA and Argadin Gene Technique Fry. I'm Amesha van Manen, Managing Director of Proterra Foundation, and I will introduce you briefly to this webinar. But before we start, I would like to remind you about three main logistics about this webinar. So you have all been put on mute to avoid any background noises disturbing the presentations. The webinar will be recorded and the recording together with the presentations will be shared after the webinar. And please don't hesitate to share your questions and ideas. You can do that during the webinar by using the chat function and we have reserved the time slot at the end to answer all of your questions. I will start with a brief introduction about Proterra Foundation and the ENGA. Florian from Argit Gene Technik Fry will follow and represent um, the non GM market in Europe. Then, followed by the presentation of Heike, who will go into more details about our topic and discuss and explain us more about the EU Commission's plan to deregulate new GMOs. So briefly about uh, um, Proterra Foundation. We are, from, from, we are a um, foundation in the Netherlands and who have, many of you know us um, for the Proterra standard. That is a sustainability scheme that we develop continuously and we are an organization next to developing that standard that also organizes um, webinars, um, trainings, and um, dialogues to increase outreach and you know, help companies reach sustainable supply chains. The Proterra standard is a non-GMO multi-crop sustainability standard and that covers all crucial areas of responsible supply chains. Let me also um, represent you some figures very quickly as we are going to be talking about the non-GM market as well today. So you can see on the map where we operate today. These are the countries where Proterra um, certification takes place. And more into detail, looking at soy, um, the certified volumes are around three, three and a half million tons every year. We, however, do expect this year to be less because of the non-GM developments Anybody involved um, with cro crops or commodity trains this year knows how challenging this year has been, and it's not at the end yet. Um, so um, coming back to soy and Proterra, last year we were around 3 million tons of certified, and we will publish then the numbers of 2021 in QA next year. A growing market, however, is sugarcane. Mainly, Proterra certification of sugar cane takes place in South America and Asia, as you can see also on the map. Um, last year, that was around almost 8 million tons, and it's increasing every year. And let's move to our topic from today. ENGA is the new European non-GMO industry association in Brussels. It has been founded in 2020 by Argegen Technik Frei, Dona Soja, and VLOG, which is the German Association for Food Without Genetic Engineering. In Brussels, it is the only association in the conventional food sector that advocates for non-GMO um, agriculture and feed and food. ENGA is this way, the voice of the non-GMO food and feed sector today at the EU level. It also secures and supports the expansion of non-GMO production. And not only has it developed an, an established and trusted quality standard, but has also become an important European market factor. Florian will explain more about this in a bit. ENGA also represents national non-GMO industries and economic operators, such as agriculture, feed and food processing, retail or certification as a single European association. 
ENGA also advocates for the strict regulation of all the new GMOs in order to keep untested and invisible GMOs for entering the EU feed and food supply chains. An important task is also to support consumers in their choice for a GMO-free agriculture by promoting food that excludes GMO plants in production chains. So these are very important key areas that ENGA is focusing and working on every day. This, I would like to pass on uh, the word to Florian, who will uh, explain us more about the non-GMO market in Europe, its economic and also its role for consumers today. Florian, the word is yours. Thank yes, you. thank you, Emil Good afternoon to um, you all. It's great to see um, a few familiar people here in this round, and I'm happy to be able to have this exchange um, today on the non-GMO issue with you all. Just for a, a brief um, introduction for those who don't know me, my name is Florian Faber. I'm uh, Managing Director of um, Arge Gentechnik Frei, which is um, the Austrian multi-stakeholder platform for the labeling of um, non-GMO food and feed products. And I have to admit, I've been around for a while. I started this project um, together with others in um, 1997. Um, so um, I've seen quite a lot of the uh, debates and discussions and developments on non-GMO markets um, all over Europe. I'd like to um, touch uh, four uh, main um, issues in the presentation. First, briefly um, introduce Agegen Technik Frei as a platform and the Austrian market to you. And briefly talk about um, the origins and developments um, uh, in the European non-GMO market talk about current market um, developments because we're, I think we're in an interesting booming market situation at the moment and touch some of the um, key challenges um, that I see for the industry um, at the moment. Next, please. In a nutshell, um, I'll be touching some of these um, points later on. Arge Gentechnik Frei, um, for sure, is a pioneer um, in the area of um, non-GMO uh, production. The um, labeling system was founded and started in um, 1997 at the very earliest um, stages where no other um, comparable organization or system um, was around, um, neither in Europe um, nor anywhere else in the world. So we had to, do, we had to cover a, a lot of um, groundwork and uh, basic things like um, developing tar uh, standards, etc. Now, um, I think uh, the Austrian non-GMO market is a very well um, established um, market. There are about six hundred, six and a half thousand products um, using the label through all um, product areas with um, a couple of segments, uh, complete uh, dairy product segments, uh, the complete egg production segment, complete poultry um, segment that have been turned fully to non-GMO production already something like 10 or more years ago. And we have an interesting um, distribution of companies and institutions supporting the platform, starting from um, small little farms to the um, largest uh, food producing and um, retailer uh, companies in Austria. And that's, I think, one of the uh, key elements that brought uh, the platform to the position uh, where it is now, where it really has an important position on the market, that from the very beginning, um, retail was one of the um, driving forces for um, establishing non-GMO labeling without this support by, by, by the big retailers, we wouldn't be where we um, are at the moment. Plus we have, and I think that's another important factor, a very um, high awareness um, of the label on the Austrian markets and um, a very high uh, credibility um, with consumers. Next charts, please. Just a little bit of history um, so that you know how this project and basic, basically non-GMO production in Europe um, could develop. Um, Arge Gentechnik Frei was founded in 1997 after there was a major um, referendum um, in Austria 
1997, that was briefly after the first um, non-GMO products came on the market in Europe. And the referendum um, collected 1.23 million signatures against the use of um, GMOs in agriculture and food products, which is about one fifth um, of uh, the Austrian population and a significant success um, for um, a referendum. And that sort of caused the necessity to offer um, certified non-GMO product um, to consumers. And it was a collision from the very beginning in a sort of um, multi-stakeholder platform, which I think was very important for the success, combining retailers from the very beginning, the major part of Austrian retailers, large and small um, food and feed producers, but also um, farming organizations, both organic um, and conventional scientists and NGOs from the field of consumer protection, environmental protection. So in fact, it was a sort of a multi-stakeholder um, microcosmos that was a, an, an important factor to have all these important discussions about the development of standard of the system and all the many challenges we had to face in the last well, 24 years it's now. Yeah? Um, and maybe just to touch um, some of the key reasons um, of success um, as, as I see them, the aspect of bringing together um, all these uh, multi-stakeholder um, institutions in a constructive way definitely is a key asset or was a key asset has been a key asset since the founding. The platform has always been both politically and economically um, independent financing itself only through um, labeling and uh, uh, licensing fees taking no public money, um, which was an important factor also when we think about credibility and independence. And definitely an advantage um, the Austrian market um, has to other European countries from the very beginning. Um, and there has been and still is a wide social political consensus against the use of GMOs in agriculture and uh, food production. And this has always been shared by all parties, by all institutions. So that, of course, made it a lot um, easier. That's one factor. Another factor from the very beginning, we started the system as an integrated system, one standard, um, one label, and prevented some of the mistakes that have been done, for example, in the organic sector, where you still have several um, uh, labels on the market. And um, again, Technikfrei as a platform sees itself as a proactive player and lobbyist and market driver, which is also important to bring um, such a system forward on the markets and in the political, on the political agenda. Next chart. Um, <clears throat> to briefly take you through um, the origins and development um, of the non-GMO markets um, in Europe. I hope I'm not boring too many people in this round um, with that. And to highlight the sort of um, most important driving um, periods and factors um, to have the market develop to such an extent. Probably most of you know that um, uh, uh, GMO production is not such an old um, business. The first commercial um, cultivation of GMO soy took place in 1996 in the US. And consequently, the first vessels um, with, not, with GMO soy arrived in Europe um, in late spring um, 1996, if I remember correctly, and caused strong um, social, social political controversies in many countries, especially um, in the German um, speaking countries, which always were sort of a driving force on the non-GMO issue, but also um, on a wider European um, scale with the um, Austrian um, referendum against um, GMOs as sort of one of the highlights and starting factor for, for AG Gentechnik Frei um, in Austria. And then um, in August um, 1997, I still remember very well, the first uh, vessel with um, certified non-GMO soy came from Brazil uh, to Europe on the initiative of and impulse of, of, of Mr. Pilstel, an Austrian trader who sort of is one of the pioneers as well. He did that 
on his own risk. Um, it was a huge financial loss, but um, it established the possibility of having um, a certified um, non-GMO um, on the market. It was sort of a real kicking um, impulse um, for, for developments. The first non-GMO standard was established um, in 1998 in Austria in the um, Austrian Codex um, Alimentarius guideline for the labeling of um, non-GMO food with the advantage, as I said from the very beginning, that it always was a production and certification and monitoring um, standards. These two things belong together um, and need, are very important to give uh, credibility with um, consumers. And the first um, products with a non-GMO label um, were brought on the market in Austria in 1998. Two of the major drivers, I think, for the um, uh, non-GMO market um, all over Europe were on one hand um, in 1999, the EU regulation um, 2092-99 um, that established that all um, organic products um, have to be um, non-GMO and establish the non-GMO standard for organic production. And then um, especially um, EU legislation on the labeling of um, GMO products that was a result of, I think, a seven year long political debate um, in Europe and establ establishing the labeling regulations for um, food that was produced with the aid of um, GMOs with two major gaps. I'm only briefly touching them as probably most of you know them. One gap um, is that additives such as vitamins, enzymes, etc., produced um, by uh, genetical engineering don't have to be labeled. And the major gap that feed um, does not have to be labeled. So this was sort of a strong impulse um, for many producers that produce different um, animal products um, to, to see um, a factor of positioning and establishing a special um, quality standard here. And in Austria, 2004, 2005 was the time when the major developments on the market um, took place. For example, with all the big um, dairy companies switching to um, non-GMO labeling to have uh, a sort of additional value for um, uh, uh, consumers. And then in 2008, um, labeling systems were established in other um, European countries, Germany with the EGG and Technikdurchführungsgesetz, Slovenia, Luxembourg, France. So slowly um, uh, a European non-GMO market um, developed um, around 2008, 2009, 2010 with the major developments and impulses taking place after 2014, 2015. Just two highlights from Austria I would like to mention since um, 2010, the full um, dairy and egg market has been turned, converted to a um, non-GMO production and 2012 the complete um, poultry market. Um, and with the growing um, of a European market, another item that I'll briefly touch um, towards the end popped up, um, non-GMO regulation is based on national regulations in Europe. So we have about 15 different national standards at the moment, which of course is becoming a bigger and bigger problem the, more, the, 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 the wider the market gets. So there is a strong need for harmonization of the European non-GMO systems over the next years. Next slide, please. Um, I like the slides put together by um, uh, VLOG because I think it gives um, a good impression that non-GMO labeling is not isolated in a couple of countries like Austria or Germany, but really is a, a pan-European um, issue with um, uh, labeling systems um, in place in a lot of European countries. And just to highlight the most recent developments, there is a labeling system in place in Hungary um, since um, early 2017. Poland started um, its labeling system early 2020. Switzerland um, in July 2020. France always had a, uh, or had a, a labeling standard for a long time that primarily was used um, by um, Carrefour and uh, some of the Carrefour producer. 
and introduced um, a, a standard for um, feed for dairy products in 2020 and check here um, also. So you see there's quite a lot of um, uh, dynamic on the European markets. And if you um, go to the next slide, Emesha, um, I'd like to give an impression from um, two different markets on uh, the current situation and how the market is developing at the moment. On the one hand, we have a booming market um, in Germany, primarily de developing since 2014, 2015 with um, significant uh, market developments. Um, uh, at the, in 2020, there was a total sale of um, uh, 12, uh, 6, 4, 5 million Europe um, of products labeled with the German Onegin Technik um, label. And that's an increase um, uh, in relation to the previous um, year by uh, plus 19 percent and this can be seen on the next um, uh, chart in an even more impressive way um, that it sure is um, a continually um, a growing market and the expectations um, are in the same direction for 20 for 21 and 22 and i see in germany something now that took place um, in austria that there is the trends and the attempts to um, convert full um, production segments. So um, if these numbers are correct, and I think they're from mid-21, um, about 72% of egg production in Germany already is converted to non-GMO and 98% um, uh, of, of um, egg production, sorry, 72% uh, of dairy production and 98% of um, egg production. And of course, um, Germany is a huge market and is an important pull factor also for um, non-GMO production in other European countries that import um, uh, to Germany, especially um, Italy and Poland, but also other, um, other markets. Next slide, please. And then in relation to that, Austria um, as a sort of well-established um, market with about six and a half thousand products. The um, conversion of the major sectors I already touched. A very um, important development I see, I see that took place um, uh, in June this year um, when non-GMO production was established as an obligatory standard by the Austrian government for um, all public purchasing processes. Um, like in hospitals, um, communities, etc., for um, dairy products, egg products, and poultry. And in a stepwise development um, will um, continue to be expanded um, also for the pork segment um, uh, till 2025. And this is the major challenge uh, we're still confronted with um, in the market to convert also um, pork production at the moment, about 10 to 12% of uh, the Austrian pork production are non-GMO, primarily in the quality segment and with own brands of um, retailers. And the, the um, expectation is that this um, uh, will change significantly over the next two to three years. So in Austria, it was possible to establish non-GMO production as sort of a USB and widely accepted quality standard for um, Austrian food production with the results that it's also quite a good and important um, export criteria for um, Austrian uh, products and Austrian producers. Next chart. Just two brief and quick charts um, to, to, to um, show you the ex ex exception um, of um, non-GMO labeling with consumers, high public awareness in all market research uh, between 75 and 80% for the label, much more important to me, high credibility um, contributed to the label by consumers, always in the top three to five um, range um, of all um, Austrian food labels, always around 63 to um, 70%. So I think that's um, one of the key strengths um, and probably resulting um, to uh, the strong 
um, transparency uh, standards, um, certification and monitoring standards that the system had since the very beginning. Next chart. And this also um, uh, established itself um, with uh, buying motives um, for consumers. Non-GMO production always has been on the very, very top end of um, uh, buying motives for Austrian consumers together with Austrian production, freshness, um, quality, etc. So this really, the system really had an impact on um, the Austrian markets, I think we can say. Next slide. Last um, but not least, just to um, briefly um, touch some of the key challenges that I think we face on a European scale, on a global scale, um, for non-GMO labeling and non-GMO production um, in the next years. On the one hand, I briefly touched it, the major disadvantage of the current um, uh, uh, non-GMO standards is that most of them, apart from the um, Danube soy, uh, Danube region um, uh, non-GMO production and monitoring standard, most all the others are on a national basis. Some of them are quite similar, German standard, Austrian standard, Slovenian standard. In other countries, looking at France, Switzerland, there are huge differences. And in a growing European market, that of course is a, a, a major issue that needs to be addressed. Then um, we've all probably witnessed um, the soaring costs of um, non-GMO soy, um, especially in the first half um, of this year with non-GMO soy um, reaching price levels of, of about twice um, uh, double prices compared with um, conventional soy that really caused um, huge disturbances on the Austrian market and also on other European markets as far as I can, uh, could witness. Um, then this moves into one of the key factors that needs to be addressed um, that there's the need to um, really safeguard long-term availability of non-GMO um, soy in appropriate um, quality. Especially in Germany, there will be developments over the next 10 years of retailers um, establishing more and more um, animal welfare criteria um, for their meat production. And this is also um, combined with um, uh, non-GMO feed criteria. So there will be strong um, requests um, for non-GMO soy, especially, and other products that need to be addressed well in advance with the producing countries in order to um, safeguard the availability. Similar situation we have in the, in the, in the fields of additives in non-GMO quality. Most of them, vitamins, enzymes, et cetera, come um, from um, Asia with, um, I would say, at least questionable certificates. So this is an issue that needs to be um, addressed too. And then at least I know that from um, Austria, I know that from Germany, uh, we're not in a situation that non-GMO um, is on the top of the um, public agenda um, anymore. This, it has been, the issue has been replaced in the public uh, debate by um, animal welfare, the plastic debates, the climate debate, of course, CO2 footprints, regional production, and as we come to a huge and major challenge for non-GMO production where um, Heike Moldenhauer will elaborate a bit more. Um, this is of high importance that um, we will be able on a Europe-wide scale um, to bring up the benefits um, and the importance of non-GMO um, production on the public um, agenda. Um, again, to an extent we had um, in the um, around the turn of the century. So thank you very much. Um, this is my last um, chart already, and I'm looking forward to discussing with you, with you afterwards and hand the ball over to Heike. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Florian, for giving us this great overview. It really helps to understand where it was started and what are the current developments today. Um, 
And we will, as I mentioned, we will have a bit of time at the end for the questions. So please share um, those with us in the chat. And now we continue with Heike's presentation. Heike, the word is yours. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks. Um, please, uh, the next slide. Uh, so my um, presentation has the title, the EU Commission's plan to deregulate new GMOs. And I will start with a brief overview of the content of my presentation. So I um, begin with the uh, current status of new GMOs, then um, introduce the EU Commission's plan to deregulate new GMOs, pass over to the political process and the timetable that is known so far. Then I go to the impacts of a deregulation for um, the general food sector. And then um, I will continue with the impacts for the non-GMO sectors in particular. The non-GMO sectors are the organic and the conventional non-GMO sectors. And I will conclude with a question and some ideas what to do, how to deal with the current situation. So next slide, please, many thanks. Um, I start with um, a definition what is meant with new GMOs. Um, I think you are aware of it, but I um, repeat that that are um, these techniques. Um, like CRISPR-Cas, ODM, and TALENTS that are uh, named as new GMOs. Um, and the term why we use new GMOs, um, I would like to um, explain that. Um, you are aware of other terms like new breeding techniques, new genomic techniques, or genome editing techniques. And with the term uh, somebody uses um, there is that is combined with a positioning or with a political statement. Those who use the term new GMOs are in favor of the regulation under the current law, and those who use other terms, they are in favor of a deregulation of the new GMOs. So I think you are all. Um, very aware of the outcome of um, the ruling of European Court of Justice in 2018. That was a landmark ruling and has, it has confirmed that new GMOs have to be regulated in the same manner as old GMOs. And that means they are all subject to the precautionary principle. That means before they go onto the market, an authorization process is obligatory and obligatory is as well an environmental and food safety risk assessment. When these new GMOs enter the market, then they are subject to transparency requirements. And that means that traceability throughout the whole value chain as well as labeling is obligatory. Next slide, please. So what is the EU Commission planning to do? The Commission has published end of April this year a study or a working document on what uh, the Commission calls new genomic techniques. And the result is uh, very briefly that the current EU GMO legislation is not fit for purpose, not fit for purpose uh, the words of uh, the EU Commission, and I think a little bit, um, yeah, EU language. So um, the focus um, of the study are plans, and for plans, policy action is needed according to the Commission. And um, for certain plans or certain GMOs, and that are plants produced with targeted mutagenesis and cisgenesis. To keep it very simple, that are both kind of GMOs without the integration of DNA from other species. So there are two reasons, um, according to the Commission, why policy action is needed. The first one is 
that some um, that um, there is a similar risk profile um, as um, that these plants have a similar risk profile as plants obtained with conventional breeding techniques, according to the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority. And the other reason why policy action is needed is that these plants have the potential to contribute to the goals of the Green Deal. So what follows from this uh, policy action in the words of the commission, that is no uh, um, thanks um, in the words of uh, the commission, that is the adaption of uh, authorization of the authorization processes, risk assessment, labeling and traceability. Adaptation sounds uh, very neutral or harmless, but what is meant in fact is a deregulation and that means a lowering of standards. And now, Anisha, please. So, um, of course, uh, there has been a lot of criticism against uh, these plans uh, for deregulation, criticism from us and uh, many other organizations. And I will focus on the main reasons the Commission has presented for deregulation. Um, the first was a similar risk profile as plants uh, obtained with conventional breeding techniques. Our criticism is that uh, the EFSA has not considered all relevant studies. Then um, there is no experience with new GMOs. They have not a history of safe use. In fact, they have a history of nearly any use with only three new GMOs on the market so far. And um, similarity to breeding does not imply safety. And what is the main difference between breeding and um, new genome um, editing techniques? That is, with these new techniques, the whole genome is accessible to changes. And that means that the depth of an intervention into the genome is much higher. And um, uh, our criticism of um, the claim that these new GMOs can contribute to Green Deal objectives. objectives. Um, as I said, we have three new, um, three plants um, developed with new GMO techniques uh, on the market. That means that these um, plants are very hypothetical and it is um, very uh, unclear whether these plants will ever materialize. They are so far promises and not a market reality. So therefore, uh, our concern is that um, we will have a lowering of safety and transparency standards for so far completely unproven sustainability claims. Next slide, please. So the timetable, the political process as uh, announced by the commission, that is um, first of all, uh, now um, closed inception impact assessment as a first step of a deregulation. We have contributed to uh, this impact, uh, this inception impact assessment. It will serve as a basis for the much uh, broader impact assessment scheduled for the second quarter 2022. There will be a 12 weeks consultation period. And with this results, the commission will come with a legislative proposal announced for the second quarter 2023. If this legislative proposal is on the table, then negotiations will start with the member states and the European Parliament. Both the member states and the parliament has to agree on a common position before it starts into the so-called co-decision procedure with the commission. And then all three legislative political bodies at EU level 
Commission, Member States and European Parliament have to agree on a common legislation. That can last if it is not so controversial, um, at least one year, but it can last up to three years. So therefore, we have no idea how long this whole process will last. Next slide, please. Yes, impacts of deregulation of new GMOs for the food and feed sector in general. Um, if these plants derived from targeted mutagenesis and cisgenesis will be excluded from the current EU GMO legislation, that would mean they, there would be no more risk assessment and no traceability and labeling. And that will refer to approximately of 95% of all new uh, genetically modified plants currently in the pipeline. These are data um, provided from the European Research Center in the context of uh, the EU uh, study on new, uh, on new genomic techniques. So that is or well, that will be the vast majority of plants now regulated as GMOs under the current regulation. This would mean a loss of control over all value chains um, due to the lack of labeling. Uh, labeling would be ab um, abolished as well as traceability. And that would mean at the end that new GMOs can be present everywhere not, of course, not only in non-GMOs and uh, organic value change. It would mean that untested and invisible GMOs can be on new fields, uh, on the markets, in supermarket shelves, and on plates. So that means that all business um, operators uh, would be impacted by this uh, deregulation as well as consumers. Next slide, please. Yes, um, it would be the conventional and the organic non-GMO se uh, sectors that would be definitely affected. Um, to start with the conventional non-GMO sectors, we expect massive setbacks as, uh, because uh, a non-GMO label has to be comprehensive and has to reliably exclude old and new GMOs. And a non-GMO label is extremely explicit. And um, it is um, important that it has uh, the, the trust of consumers. And I think that will get lost if it can't be uh, not reliable, reliably exclude all kinds of GMOs. So we expect the same um, severe setbacks for the organic sector as well. Uh, it is known from all opinion polls that if uh, consumers are asked why they prefer organic products, that the exclusion of GMOs as well as pesticide is a, as pesticides is a major selling point, and that would be eliminated. Uh, the organic sector can't exclude new GMOs anymore. So both, um, both non-GMO sectors uh, would be faced with the loss of consumer trust. We can't explain um, when a non-GMO product is contaminated uh, with new, uh, new GMOs. That is very difficult. And is, it is difficult as well to explain that organic could be in the future with GMOs. For a non-GMO sector, in, um, that would mean a loss of um, investments. Um, it was um, very, um, uh, it was very um, cost intensive to uh, establish um, a non-GMO system. And that means, um, changing formula formulations, uh, ingredients in, in food, and uh, the development of quality assurance systems and marketing. So it would be um, 
I think very, um, yeah, very um, complicated for both sectors uh, if they are faced with uh, with a deregulation of um, of non of the of these new GMOs. The next slide, please. So we have, as a non-GMO sector, communicated our key demands to the Commission um, in this inception impact assessment. And the key demands are that all new GMOs have to remain subject of a comprehensive risk assessment. We have uh, demanded our freedom to conduct business. Uh, that has to be ensured for the conventional and the organic non-GMO sectors. And what is necessary for our freedom to conduct business is that we have an implementation of clear coexistence rules, coexistence between an um, agriculture and a food production system with and without GMOs. Uh, important for us are labeling and traceability systems, and important uh, as well, um, li a liability system, that means uh, a polluter pays um, system, or in, in case of there is, or there will be a contamination of our conventional and organic non-GMO um, value chains. So that um, is important for us. And uh, we have also communicated um, for the future impact assessment, the uh, importance of again and again, that is our point we repeat, I think for some years without um, having uh, um, been heard uh, so far from the commission, uh, the, de the development and implementation of a thorough, and tra uh, tra thorough traceability and labeling system. Um, this is um, important that the EU Commission will take its responsibility, and that would mean that the Commission has to um, has to um, take responsibility of budgets, research capacities, um, as well as um, a coordinating uh, function. Um, concerning all these endeavors from national, uh, from national member states that are trying to develop detection methods. So that, is, um, that are our key demands. And I think, um, yes, we have to um, repeat it um, so long um, um, till the commission is, um, is dealing with our demands. I ask for the next slide, please. What we have initiated as ENGA was a, a retailer's resolution. Retailers would be this sector, the food sector, that would be absolutely affected in case of a deregulation of new GMOs, because it is the retail sector that has direct contact to its customers, to consumers, and consumers in their vast, vast majority uh, reject GMOs, old GMOs, as well as new GMOs. So um, the uh, headline of, these, uh, of the retailers' resolution, European retailers take a strong stand against deregulation, deregulating new GMOs, makes very clear what is the content of the resolution. Content is um, very brief. Uh, remain the current EU GMO legislation, remain um, uh, the precautionary princi principle, the risk assessment, and maintain labeling and traceability. What is remarkable with uh, the retailers' resolution, you see it with uh, the logos, we have a very unusual and very broad alliance of the big dealers, um, the big players, in the retail sectors and the organic um, supermarket change. So a very um, unusual alliance, but both are, both are very aware 
that their business uh, is under threat and that there two that there are two booming markets under threat the conventional and the organic non gmo sector and what is remarkable as well uh, that is um, this constellation business against business um, there is um, this, uh, this business that is in favor of a deregulation that are the usual suspects, uh, the biotech companies like Cotiva and Bayer, but there is another group of, of businesses and that are retailers and they are definitely um, in favor of uh, maintenance of, of the current uh, EU GMO legislation. So therefore um, my uh, question was what to do and the answer is continue uh, our lobbying work and continue to make our voice heard against the new commission. So, yeah, I think last slide are my contact details or ENGA contact details. So if you want to reach me, you have the details. And now I'm um, happy with your comments and questions. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Heike, for great, giving this great analysis and helping us to understand what's going on in the background. And before um, you put yourself on mute, I would like to also address the first question to you. So would you, like, would you see less risk if analysis would be available for the new GMOs? So, you know, um, as we know today, uh, there was some breakthrough for certain uh, rapeseed analysis and certain GMOs, but definitely not for all. So that is also a hot topic today. Um, in your view, would that help? Could you repeat the question? I wasn't able to, to yes, hear so you. Would you see uh, less risk um, if analysis would be, so laboratory analysis would be available for all the new GMOs? Um, I have, I think less risk for, for, for what? Um, is it a question about uh, um, analytical possibilities? Um, so, um, practically, you, you um, listed a big number of risks that you see and also on the market, also in terms of credibility, etc. Um, and would you see that that could help? Um, if if analy analytical solutions would be available for the... Uh, okay, things. so I think I, I've got it now. So I think uh, it will be a question of time that we will have uh, analy analytical possibilities for uh, these new uh, GMOs. I think it's a question of, um, of budgets and uh, research capacities. So, so far, nothing has been done from the EU Commission to support uh, detection methods. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that has to, has to be changed. And if in case uh, we don't have uh, the analytical methods via um, laboratory methods, then uh, traceability will always work. It is completely for sure that a company that has produced a new GMO and will um, place it on the market, that the company will communicate that it has uh, used a new genomic technique. So therefore, um, a traceability system can be established and, and has to be established. And I, see, I don't see any uh, difficulty with that. So therefore, I think um, if there is a political will and political support, that will work. Hey, we have a comment here that uh, from Augusto that HRI labs in America have developed analytical solutions that can be applied to a number of new GMOs. Yes, um, that is true. And uh, I uh, know um, um, which um, research uh, uh, Augusto is uh, referring to. Um, that was uh, the work for uh, detection of um, GMO canola. Um, developed by the company Cebus. So yes, there is a detection method on, on the market, but that has been rejected from the competent uh, authorities uh, in the EU um, for, I think, um, not very convincing reasons, but uh, that was uh, the laboratory um, that has um, started with developing detection methods and uh, 
as far as I'm aware, they will continue. So therefore, I think it's, it's a question of time that we have laboratory methods for detection. Thank you. But I feel it's very interesting, you know, that transparency and traceability is always a key solution in any debate actually connected to you know from deforestation to genomics so um, we see that it is really returning and that's very important that that is implemented in the supply chains no matter what topics we are concentrating on yes um, and uh, just to add that um what I find so astonishing and frightening is that the Commission is uh, going to, um, to, to stop traceability and labeling, and that is such a step backwards against what has been achieved so far, and that is what consumers and business uh, operators demand. So therefore, I can't imagine that the Commission uh, will succeed with, this, with these plans. Extremely important point. Thank you. I'd like, like to underline what exactly. I'd like to underline what Heike just said. This is a major issue that we see with retailers um, in Austria on, on, on this topic. They are really um, uh, embarrassed and angry because they say um, uh, the food business is moving um, towards more traceability, more transparency on all matters. Um, and uh, traceability and transparency are sort of key assets in the food business, um, at least in the quality sector. So it's not understandable how um, uh, uh, the commission um, could start an attempt to reduce traceability um, uh, on a social politically um sensitive sensitive issue um such as gen um, uh, genetic engineering so this definitely is a key issue that we will have to position very strongly in the debate in the coming weeks months and years thank you and i see you also posted, posted an um, invitation that there will be probably next year in april um a, a major conference on this topic Yes, we just have confirmation by the Austrian government that this will be done. <clears throat> um, experts, scientists and business to be invited um, for a Europe-wide um, conference in order to have an impact on the European debate. And of course, we'll share the information um, through the, the current organizations as soon as a date and other um, details are finalized. Many, many thanks. And I have a last question before we find we have to close because it's already four o'clock. Why, in your view, Florian, why is the non-GMO market so heavily concentrating on the German-speaking spe German countries? Ask the French. <laughs> <laughs> um, good question. As, as I tried to... Um, uh, uh, address. I've seen this since the early um, dates of the um, GMO campaigns, starting with 95, 96. The German speaking countries were those where the most controversies and public uprest um, could have been um, witnessed. I know um, that in France, for example, um, uh, which with at least with with Carrefour, there is a strong um, uh, movement and intention to uh, position on GMO labels um, on food products. I just returned from Italy and have seen a couple of products in the shelf, but honestly, um, I can't really give an explanation why um, it's it's such a Germanic speaking issue. I even would reduce this a bit more because you see these products uh, in Austria and um, uh, uh, Germany. There are hardly any um, products with non-GMO label on the Swiss market. The Swiss um, labeling standard is very complex, very difficult, and nobody uses it, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I don't see any more questions, but if you do have, please reach out to us, send it to us via email. We will be happy to send you back the answers from our experts here. Thank you for your participation, everyone. And as mentioned at the beginning, we will share the presentations and the recording with you later on. Take care, stay safe, and see you soon.
Thank you, Emerson. Thank you. Thank you.